present a lesson from God's word to you this morning, to have the opportunity to be able to worship our Lord and Savior as we've been able to do so far this Lord's Day. Thank you for Blaine and the songs he's led and uh, the prayer that Scott offered up. And uh, looking forward to, as we go throughout the rest of this morning, having the opportunity to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we do so, we strive to do so in spirit and in truth, having that right heart, that right mind, that right focus, and at the same time doing it in the way in which God has commanded us to do so. There are a number of our own number here that are missing just due to the holiday season, traveling uh, to be with family and and uh, potentially traveling back today, but as a result of that, we also have those who are visiting with us, and we're thankful for you being with us, and we invite you to open up your Bibles and to follow along in our study this morning. If there is anything that, that I say or anything that, that concerns you, that confuses you, please let me know. I, I encourage you to not only follow along with the scriptures, but do as the brethren at Berea did, and that's Examine the things that are said, compare them to Scripture, and if they are so, it is only then that you will make application to your life. For our study this morning, I would like us to look at the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. At the very beginning of this letter, Paul makes a statement to the brethren at Corinth that I want us to examine a little bit to make application to our life and to our faith. Paul Writing here says, beginning in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, you recognize how many times Paul uses the word comfort in these first few verses and really the entirety of this letter as he goes about the second letter to the brethren at Corinth, talking about the God of all comfort. Thanks be to God that we have a God who is a God of all comfort. And whenever you think about Paul's statement that he makes here, and you think about the context that it's written in, and one of the things that he says and he's hitting at throughout this letter is the fact that he and the other apostles, because of their work in the ministry of Christ, of, of going out and, and, and presenting the gospel, have suffered much tribulation, have had a lot of affliction in their life as a result of that. In fact, in verses 8 and 9 of this first chapter, a little bit later from where we just read, he says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, Above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Recognition of Paul throughout his life is that although he was a Christian, it didn't mean that he escaped affliction and tribulation and suffering. You know, so many times I think that that is a misunderstanding with those in the world that, 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 that because you are a Christian, that that means that you're not going to suffer. That means that you're not going to go through tribulation, infliction, affliction, and suffering, and, and those things that, that they won't come upon you. And whenever we look at one such as Paul and others throughout Scripture, we clearly see that that's not the case. In fact, we read throughout Scripture that, that if you are going to live for Christ, and that all that live for Christ, all that live godly will suffer persecution, there will be things that you go through as a result. But it's not only the, the, the persecution or, or the tribulation just due to the fact that you are a Christian, although I believe that that is really what Paul is hitting at here. He's going through a lot of what he, what, what he has because of his work as a minister for Christ. We understand and we recognize, as Paul does, the tribulation, the affliction comes upon all, and that includes all the children of God. Thanks be to God that he is a God of all comfort and that we can go to him for comfort. Despite the fact that there is tribulation and affliction that we go through, we can turn to God, and as Paul states a little bit later, a couple times in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, that's why he says, we do not lose heart. Why not, Paul? You're going through all this affliction. 
You're going through all this suffering and pain. Why, 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 why don't you lose heart? Why don't you just give up and throw in the towel? We don't lose heart because we have a God of all comfort who is there to comfort us. In spite of all this, in spite of going through this. So we want to look at that this morning. This idea, God of all comfort. And although we've already stated it, stated it, let's look at the reality of tribulation and affliction. And the reality of it is, the tribulation comes upon all of God's children. I said, I know I've just stated this, but this is something that, that, that we need to realize. Those in the world, and there might even be those within the church, that have a misunderstanding and think because I'm a Christian, that means I'm not going to go through something that's, that, 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 uh, that, that life is going to be all roses, that I'm not going to have affliction in my life. We quickly realize that that's not the case. We look at those who have lost loved ones. Maybe even you've lost a loved one recently or in your life. Those who uh, have had various things that go on, losing loved ones, having a bad marriage, and for whatever reason you think that, 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 that there was peace in your life and now there's not because of marital issues. Maybe you have a bad relationship with parents or siblings or in-laws. Maybe it's because you're standing for the truth and they aren't. Maybe it's because they just don't want anything to do with you. For whatever the reason is, something's happened. And that relationship has gone south. And they don't want to be around you, and that hurts. Whether it is your sibling or your child or a parent or your in-laws, it hurts. Pain and affliction results of these relationships that go south. Potentially it's because you have those, whether it be parents, siblings, or in-laws, or children, who are no longer faithful. Perhaps it's just because, as I said, the relationship has gone south. Maybe it's issues you're having at work. Maybe it's health problems. And there's other things. There's things that I, I, I may not have experienced in my life, only being 33 now younger man, that you've experienced that, 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 that I might not have even thought about. But the reality of it is, whenever we look around and whenever we look at our life and we look at others' lives, we know that pain and suffering happen. I was talking about, I was mentioning those relationships that might have gone south, whether it be with a child, with an in-law. And throughout the year, those things hurt. But then we get to this time of year, the time when we come together for Thanksgiving meals and feasts and Christmas dinner and feasts. And what used to be no longer is. And what used to be such a joyous time is no longer a joyous time as it used to be. Because you think about those relationships that no longer are for whatever reason. This tribulation is something that comes upon us all, and we all have to deal with it. Maybe it's not a relationship that's gone south, but maybe it's a loved one that is now passed on. And you get to that first or second year of holidays where they're no longer there. I remember this whenever Jade's grandpa passed back in 2012. He passed beginning in November, and then you hit that first Christmas. First Thanksgiving without Papa there. The one that was always at the head of the table, the one that always led the family, the one that always led the prayer for the meal. The one that led the family in those regards but led the family spiritually is no longer there and there is pain and suffering as a result of that. While there is comfort that he is in and, and, and has that hope of heaven that he no longer has to go through this life of pain and suffering and we know that God comforts us in that way, the fact that he is gone, that pain is still there. So the reality of it is that tribulation and affliction, while we like to think that whenever we're Christians, it, it just it ceases to exist, it doesn't. It's still there. And you know what happens from time to time is whenever these things come up, sometimes the thought creeps into our mind, creeps into those minds, or into people's minds that, this came from God. This pain that I'm coming through, this is his fault. Not only is this fault his fault, but he wants me to suffer. This almost appears to be the mindset of Job's wife in Job chapter 2, verse 9. After all that had happened to Job and, and his wife, 
the loss of their kids and, and their animals and all these different types of things. We know in verse 10 that Job, you know, did not sin with his lips. But in verse 9, he responds, or he, he has that response from his wife who said, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Sometimes this thought creeps into our head whenever we go through this and we start to, 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 to misinterpret things. We start to think that, 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 that almost God is the one that's doing all this, that, that he wants me to be unhappy. Unfortunately, you see people go down that path. And we need to be reminded and, and, and bring ourselves to the truth that we see in Scripture. And that is the fact that God is a God of mercy. Don't misinterpret the, 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 the situation or the circumstance and start blaming God like some do. Understand that God is a God of mercy. A point is made in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies. Father of mercies. This idea, as Art and Greek, uh, the, the, this Greek word, as Art and Gingrich says, is a display of concern over another's misfortune, pity, and compassion. Vines, another lexicon says, it means to pity, compassion for the ills of others. That's who God is. God is a God of mercy. God is a God of compassion. God cares about you. God doesn't take joy and pleasure in your suffering. He's a God of mercy. As a result of that, it's ultimately the God of comfort. And how do we know this? Well, when we look over in Ephesians chapter 4, or sorry, chapter 2, verses 4 through 7, I believe we see a manifestation of this mercy. The fact that God is a merciful God. That God cares about us. The fact that God is one who has compassion and pity for us. Beginning in verse 4, it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. The ultimate manifestation of the fact that God is a merciful God is the fact that he sent his son to die for us, to die for you, to die for me. In a time and in a moment in a situation, whenever you were undeserving of it because you were the one who separated yourself from God, God had pity and compassion upon you. This is the ultimate manifestation of the mercy of God, and it shows that God is not a God that wants you to suffer, that enjoys suffering of his creation. God is a merciful God. And this mercy that God has upon us, this, this pity for us, this compassion for us, for those, for the ills of others, for the ills of us. Misinterpret it. He has that. It's manifested in the fact that he sent us his son, and through this we have the understanding and recognition that God is the God of all comfort. God comforts us. God comforts us. You know, Paul said it this way in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because from the beginning God or because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you to our gospel for the attaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or our epistle. He's dealing with the fact that they have been saved, that they are those who have obtained salvation, sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. They have obtained this through the belief and in, in, in obedience to that gospel. And now look what he says in verse 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation, and good hope by grace, 
comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Understand that and recognize that. See, one of the things that Paul is pointing out there is we need to understand and we need to recognize that God is the God of all comfort. How can we be sure that God is the God of all comfort? I mean, look, what, look at all the things that happen in this life, not only to those in this world, but even me. The things that I go through, the things that I deal with, the sufferings and pains. How can I be sure? Because God sent his son for you. He sent his son for you that you may be saved. And as a result of that, there is an everlasting comfort that is available to you. God is the God of all comfort. We need to recognize that he is the source of all comfort. It is from God and we can be sure of it because of the fact that he sent his son. I want us to think about that idea of an everlasting comfort. Certainly it has its application to eternity. There's a comfort that is going to be there in eternity, in heaven. A comfort that we can't express or describe in that regard. But because of that hope of heaven, that salvation that is there, because of that, we can have comfort today. That everlasting comfort isn't something that is just going to only be there in the end. That everlasting comfort is something that translates that where you can have comfort right now. You can be at ease right now. That no matter what happens in this life, no matter what pain and what sorrow, what suffering you're going through, it's going to be okay. Why? Because God is a God of comfort. He's proven it by the giving of a son. We know it's going to be okay in the end. Because of that, it's everlasting from this point forward. It's certainly something that goes on forever. God being the God of comfort, but it's something that can be applied to our life right now. And this is why whenever we read Philippians 4, 6 through 7, we see that we don't have to be anxious. We don't have to worry. Why? Because by everything in prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. We can have peace in our life, and peace is a result of the mercy and comfort that can only be found in God. We can be at peace because we know God cares about us takes care of those who follow him. You think about the context of 2 Corinthians, this is why Paul is able to state in chapter 4, beginning of verse 16, as I said earlier, therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding, exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Paul was able to have comfort despite the things that he was going through, despite the affliction that he was going through, because of that focus being on heaven. Understanding that he isn't looking towards the things that are seen on this earth, but looking to the things in heaven. Paul turned to God. Because he is the God of all comfort. You know, the psalmist put it in Psalm 34, beginning in verse 17. We'll actually read down through the end of the chapter like this. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord delivers him out of all of them. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those who trust in him shall be condemned. No doubt, God is a God of comfort. God is a God of mercy. And with that comfort and that mercy comes the peace in our life. The righteous, those with a contrite spirit, and his servants can take comfort in the fact that God will take care of them. So the question comes up, where else can we go for comfort like God gives? You know, we try to find comfort in a lot of different areas in our life. 
We try to distract ourselves from the, 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 the afflictions and the pain and the suffering. Maybe we pick up a hobby. Maybe we start doing this. Maybe, maybe, maybe we read this or that. Maybe we start doing these types of things to, to distract ourselves from the pain that is there. That pain is still there. And I can relate. One of the things I love to do is I love to go fishing. And I know you all know that. I talk about it quite a bit. I get out on the boat and, it, you know, it does seem like whenever I'm out there on the water that I'm not thinking about a lot of things, that a lot of the things that consume my mind are no longer there. Then I come off the water. My mind goes right back to the pain that was there. See, we can go do things that will, for a period of time, maybe distract us from the pain that is there. But the only way to be able to actually have comfort is to turn to God, to leave your cares and concerns upon Him, to understand that He is the God of all comfort, and He has proved that by giving us His Son, and to be those who know that it's going to be okay. God cares about us. God loves us. So I don't always know what you're going through. I don't always know what struggle, what trial, what suffering, what tribulation, what heartache you might be going through. And it might be different at different points in time. What I do know and what is pointed out throughout Scripture is the source of comfort is nowhere else other than God and God alone. God is the source of all comfort. Remember that God is God. You know, in Psalm 46, verse 10, there's a simple statement that's made there. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. A lot of times we forget, whenever we're trying to deal with our pain and our suffering, who God is and the fact that He is God. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. He not only is the creator of the heavens and the earth, but he is. And we are to know that he is. He has proven himself throughout time, throughout history. He will be exalted among the nations, will be exalted in the earth. So lean upon him. Lean upon him with understanding that he is God and be still, be comforted, be know that he is God. And also remember that God is faithful. Now, I'm so appreciative of the lesson Aaron Collins gave a few weeks back from Lamentations. And we read in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We read that God is faithful. And not only is faithful, but his faithfulness is great. And as Aaron pointed out, this is, this is Jeremiah in, in a situation and, and during a time whenever there appears to be no hope. What is going on? All this pain, all this stuff that, 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 that is occurring. Why did this stuff happen? Why, 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 why is he allowing this? And he remembers and reminds himself that God is faithful. Not only that, but his faithfulness is great. And I want you to think about something along those lines. Not only is God faithful, not only is his faithfulness great, but he proves this faithfulness. You think about 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17, that Scripture provides all that man needs, gives man all the information that is needed. To be one that is complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work, to be one that, that, that is faithful, that is able to stand uh, what is going on, to be bold, to be steadfast. So whenever we think about that statement, and then we think about other statements in the New Testament pointing out the fact that the Old Testament and really the entirety of the Scripture is written for our learning and for our admonition. And then we start to go through and we study Scripture. Where can you find in Scripture, where can you read that God's faithfulness falls short? You won't. You can search the Scriptures through and through, up and down, and every single time God is faithful to His promises, every single time God proves Himself to be faithful, and not only that, but he proves his faithfulness to be great. You know what else is interesting is we oftentimes go through and use God's word to prove that God is, right? Fulfilled prophecies, historical accuracies, all those types of things. Look, God proves he is through his word, that God exists, and we use that whenever we talk 
to those who don't believe in God and atheists and others. Or maybe those who are struggling with the fact, is there, is there a God? That same book that proves that God is shows God's character and proves God's faithfulness over and over and over again. And you're not going to find a scripture, a passage, or any time where God's faithfulness falls short. So this same book, that proves, God, that proves God is, proves God's faithfulness, is a book of comfort. It's a book that needs to be studied, that we need to turn to whenever we are in those moments and remember these words of God. He gave to us the fact that he is the God of all comfort. If this is the case, we need to recognize this and turn to him. You know, you think about John 6, 66 through 68. After other disciples had turned away from Jesus, we read in verse 67 that Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Simon Peter had answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That first part is a question that we need to ask. To whom shall we go? Really, where else are we going to turn to? times of pain, times of tribulation. There's nowhere else to turn to but to God. And God has revealed himself and showed himself in his word. Use his word to comfort when you're in those situations. And not only use his word, not only study his word, but pray for comfort. You know, we read about that in 1 Peter 5, 7, to cast all our cares upon him. We just read earlier Philippians 4, 6 through 7, to be anxious for nothing but by everything in prayer and supplication. Make your requests known to God. But you know who is the one who is an example of this was Jesus in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Whenever we, whenever we read, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus, the Son of God. After the evening before, it tells us, backing up into verse 34, was healing those who were sick, those who were demon-possessed. He was doing these works. You would think after he started his ministry and is doing these things, he'd be tired. And if anybody needs some sleep, it's going to be Jesus, right? Jesus makes it a point to turn to God and to prayer, to wake up early in the morning, to arise and to go to a solitary place, and pray to God. Why? Because God is. God is the God of all comfort. We recognize also with Jesus, before he's about to face his death on the cross, the fact that he goes to, G, uh, to God in prayer in, Gethse in Gethsemane. We understand that and we recognize the power that is in prayer when we look at Scripture. We turn to God, the God of all comfort, Seeking comfort during those times. As I said, you might not know. I might not know. might not be able to lay out what you're going through and maybe what you're struggling with. Maybe what pain or sorrow or agony you're going through at this point in time. But I know that God knows. And I know that God is the God of all comfort and that we are to turn to him. That's who Paul turned to. Or giving us an example and telling us the fact that God is the God of all comfort. Recognize that he is. Understand that he is that source and turn to him. Nowhere else. Not only does Paul make that statement that lays out the fact that tribulation is really all are going to go through it and that God is the God of all comfort. It's real interesting what he says in verse 4, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, we understand from 1 Peter chapter 5, and I believe it's in verse 14, but it's near the end of that letter, that all in the brotherhood suffer. And as we pointed out, I'm not the only one that's going through suffering. I'm not the only one that's going through tribulation. I'm not the only one that is in need of comfort. And while I might be, and I need to make sure I'm turning to the right place, whenever I do get there and I turn to that right place, one of the things that I need to understand and that I need to recognize is that, other, is that others are in need. 
and others are in need of the same comfort. I'm not the only one that's going through these types of things. And with that, there is an understanding that's laid out here that I have a role to play. I can help others in that time of need. Paul not only points out here in, in verse 4, but then we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. A little bit later in this letter, Paul talks about the fact that he was comforted from the good report that he got regarding those at Corinth. Beginning in verse 5, we read, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts, and inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he comforted, or, uh, with, with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire... Your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoice even more. He goes on to talk about the fact that these were those who showed and had true godly sorrow that led and produced that, 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 that led to repentance in the zeal that they have. And one of the things that I'm getting from this is that we can be of assistance in comforting others. We can help others in their time of need. Whenever they are down, Paul makes a similar statement over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. A letter that he wrote shortly after he worked with them there. And he believed within six months and more than likely even possibly sooner than that. He writes this letter to them and within it he has a concern for them that Satan would come after them. They were newer to the faith and he was, he, he, he was concerned that they were going to be tempted. So he sends word, or so, so he sends uh, to get a report of what's going on there. And we read in verse 5, For this very reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you, and our labor might, have, uh, might be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our afflictions and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. We were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live, for now we live, if you stand fast in the Lord. See, there is a certain comfort that we can play, or a certain role, a part that we can play in helping comfort comforting others whenever they are in need. And so with that understanding and with that recognition that, that whenever we're comforted by God, we're not to just keep it to ourselves, but we are to, to go and to help others with that same comfort. We're to look out for the interest of others. We're to look out for the interest of others. We read in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship, of the spirit of any affliction or affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded having the same love being of one accord of one mind let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself let each of you look out not only for his own interests but also for the interest of others this is coming off of paul talking about the fact that he is in chains and that these might go through similar persecution, might go through similar affliction. Things might come upon them. So what are they to do? Look out for the interest of others. Be united in God and help comfort one another, despite the stuff might be going on. We'll read something similar over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 through 11, a book that's, that's filled with the, the context of the fact that you're going through suffering. Peter writes in verse 7 of chapter 4, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do so, or let him do it as with the ability with which 
God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be ye long the glory forever and ever. Amen. We recognize and realize that we are not only to look out for the interests of others, but we are to use the abilities that we have to aid and to help others. Now, I mentioned earlier this time of year, and others might be suffering, might, might be going through tribulation and pain and sorrow, and, you know, we might not even know about it. We might recognize and realize somebody just lost the loved one, and so this might be a hard time of the year for them. But maybe it's been a few years, and they're still dealing with that loss whenever it comes to this time of year. Maybe although somebody has had strained relationships over a period of time, that doesn't change the fact that they are still missing. That relationship is no longer here for whatever reason. What about those who never really even had an enjoyable holiday season or time of year? Their youth and growing up, it wasn't really a memorable time. And while the rest of us really enjoy it and look forward to it, their memories and what they're thinking about is nothing pleasant at all about this time of year. Because of that, they're down. Because of that, there's sorrow, there's pain that is there. What might keep us from helping out these from time to time, from doing what we can from time to time? It might be that we, we don't really know what to say or what to do. So what do we do? You know, I think sometimes people might just need someone to listen to. They need a friend. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12 talks about the value of a friend. The two are stronger than one. So maybe you can just go get a cup of coffee with them. And maybe you don't even talk about what's, what, 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 what's causing them to be down. Maybe it gets brought up, maybe not, but maybe just through your conversations, you're able to encourage and edify one another. Maybe just by your faithfulness and good report, you provide comfort and encouragement to others. We saw that in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 Thessalonians 3. You know, sometimes young people, little, little, younger high school, middle school, I don't know what to say to, to either my parents or those are my parents' age or older and and maybe there isn't much that you have to say except to have a smile on your face and have a warm greeting. And being a faithful Christian, something that can encourage those during this time. You know, maybe it's something that somebody needs some help around the house or stuff at the home. And you have the ability to help them out in that way. You know, maybe you don't still are just like, I, I really don't know what to say. I don't know how to, how to talk with this individual. You know, what we can all can do is pray for one another. Whenever we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, a little bit later than what we read in verses 8 and 9, Paul mentioned something that those at Corinth did in verse 11. You also helping together in prayer for us, that thanks given by many persons. And our, uh, on our behalf, for the gift granted us to us through many, prayer. Praying for those to be comforted through this time. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. and We need to offer up as many as we can. And if you're looking for something to say, you don't know what to say, say fed is always to speak the words of God. As, John, or as Peter mentioned, to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Where else are we going to go? You don't know what to say. The comforting, edifying word of God. The words that you can speak to those who are in times of need. Because as we stated earlier, it is those who are going through that struggle and that trial. Need to be turning to that word. That word of comfort that is there. Last thing before we leave. Don't leave anyone out. You know, I think that this is an unfortunate thing that happens from time to time in the Lord's church. We look out across the congregation, especially one this size, and we see those who are in need of comforting more so than others. And certainly you have the priorities that are there. You might know that somebody needs comforting. But you know who oftentimes get overlooked? 
those who are consistent, faithful Christians who don't necessarily need to be talked to about the fact that they are in wrong or in sin or anything because they're consistently faithful. But oftentimes what happens is we prioritize them at the bottom and put other people at the top, and we don't ever get to them, and they don't ever get comforted by another. They don't ever get encouraged by another. Brethren, this isn't just those who are weak in the faith that need comforting. This is all who struggle with trial and afflictions. And so the one that you maybe think, you know what, brother so-and-so has been a faithful Christian for 20, 30 years. Brother so-and-so does all this stuff in the church, or sister so-and-so does all this, but this one over here needs it. Don't miss either one of them. They are both in need of comforting. You don't know necessarily what others are going through. You don't know what has happened in their life. We might know an extent to their past of what has happened, but we don't know the depth of maybe things that have occurred that especially this time of year can bring them to sorrow. So do what we can to comfort others. First, make sure that we turn to God, understanding that he is the God of all comfort, and then in return reciprocate that by going out and helping others be comforted. Let's all struggle with trial tribulation all go through it in other words it doesn't escape anybody and all are in need and comfort let us turn to God to do so that is going to conclude this hour of worship